And thank you, thank you so much for your patience and accommodating the changes in the agenda. For us, it's been a hectic day because uh, we cannot cut the quality of the presentations that are making here and uh, some of time for a little bit of uh, questions and answers. But still, it's really a challenge to uh, create a, a hybrid environment and making a, a good synchronization between the auditorium uh, full of people, uh, as much as COVID uh, allows us to be full. But we have here an incredible group of participants on site. Also, thank you so much, Zoom participants and everybody that is watching us on the social media. Thank you for following us. I know that uh, you're probably very, very pleased with uh, the outcomes of the and the content that we have shared today. Uh, amazing contributions. And now we are going to do the closing uh, plenary. I'm uh, just calling here on uh, Uska to make a quick check. And if we have our panelists with video on, on the Zoom, so we can start as uh, apologizing also Jan McNeilis, John Merdit for the delay. It's been uh, hectic, but uh, also a little bit late on your times of the days. We also, uh, also have uh, Dr. Petra Wilson in the UK, our time, and Dr. Sergio Pion, which I already see with a nice environment from Italy. And uh, Dr. Sergio Pignon is uh, was, uh, a repeating guest speaker because of his uh, innovative uh, work. And uh, I'm sure that uh, NOC Care should be interested on that uh, perspective because of uh, telemedicine massive adoption in Italy. Sergio, welcome. Welcome to this closing plenary. And apologize for the delay. I know that you as an Italian understand it. <laughs> yes, yes, you, you know, well, Italy is from north to south, and we are used to say that uh, uh, 7.30 in north is exact, in <laughs> the center is around, in the south is what kind of gun is 7.30? <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a joke, but sometimes a joke uh, could explain uh, the truth. Absolutely, absolutely. Welcome, Dr. Petro Wilson. Welcome, uh, Dr. Ian McNichol. Uh, so good to have you here on the Zoom Mosaic. And also uh, very, very pleased to have here on our uh, auditorium this beautiful place. I, I wish you could be here to see our environment. Maybe the Regie can put us uh, later on in a perspective different from uh, this uh, uh, nice uh, video forecast we have here for our um, the share of the session here is already in place uh, dr ponciano oliveira executive board member of a uh, regional uh, authority in the north of portugal regional health authority one of the most if not the most innovative region in uh, these countries pushing the boundaries and uh, it's an honor to have him here because dr ponciano oliveira himself is an innovator He's been contributing in, from many different directions to uh, innovative projects in the region uh, that are then uh, expanding to the uh, to the uh, the rest of the nation, and it's uh, something of a, a, a personal esteem I have from his present and the fact that he's accepting here to be and uh, awarding the certificates to the to our global shapers uh, that uh, are here to have them on site and then virtually send uh, by um, postal services the other certificates we have here from the, the the faculty of medicine of port university MOOP, with the as also in this session is uh, the, the chair of the session sorry is Ro professor jean fonseca as, uh, as for the moment i was confusing uh, dr uh, ponciano Oliveira is a guest speaker that is coming for the the, the delivering of the awards Professor Jean Fonseca, uh, uh, co-host of this session, already opened at the floor this morning with very kind words, and uh, is going to also uh, be with us in the in the the, um, uh, the guest uh, uh, speakers dinner that we are organizing uh, with uh, for everybody that is in, been invited. Uh, uh, Professor Jean Fonseca is leading med seats, which is precisely the core of the innovation in terms of a new. Uh, um, 
undergraduate uh, bachelor degrees that they're going to have in, mid in digital health and translation, translation medicine, very innovative. We already, during the day, spoke about this need for this kind of uh, educational offers. And it's uh, very interesting that uh, the convergence of this uh, Health Data Forum Global Hybrid Summit is taking place precisely here. It's maybe not casualty. North of Portugal, faculty of medicine of Port University. It's uh, amazing to have these uh, contributions in the, in the table. Also, John Meredith, welcome. I was uh, making the time for you to show up. Really great to have another innovative health region, uh, uh, Wales. Unfortunately, we could not set the, the organization in, in enough in time for you to be here in, with us in present. It will be really a pleasure. I'm sure that on other occasions in the future, maybe you, could, you can. John, there's, um, this pandemic still is taking a toll on all of us for the moment. Uh, and from the US, if not, we will not be global. Dr. George Matthew, uh, it's a digital health expert. It, uh, Chief Medical Officer, he's been in different kinds of organizations, he's a medical law doctor, is now a Chief Medical Officer of Dedalus, and it's a, a company that is really aiming and uh, transforming healthcare with data. So George, welcome, and uh, it's a pleasure to have uh, all this uh, ready. So I think that we, without further ado, we can start um, this session. Uh, let's think that Perhaps Professor Jean Fonseca would take the lead now as a chair and organize the speakers according to the schedule. You have the schedule. Uh, if not, I can borrow you this one here. Over to you and good session. Thank you so much. Uh, welcome uh, to all uh, here um, uh, and, uh, and also in Zoom. And it is uh, really uh, a pleasure to be physically, but also uh, uh, going for uh, uh, this one. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I don't need the paper. Thank you. I have the digital, <laughs> the digital uh, part. But yes, hybrid also from digital and paper or digital and physical is uh, still the, the future. And I hope that uh, it remains that way because really it, it allows us uh, both to, to have the best of, of both worlds. And I will not take long and, and Paulo uh, already uh, made the, the, the introductions actually of, of the speakers and also my co-chair and, and, and uh, uh, Dr. Ponciano, which is, uh, has been said, uh, a real leader in the, in the region and the, in the innovation in the region. It's always a pleasure to, 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 have, uh, to be with him and, and to, to co-host a, a session. So let's start and, and uh, I would like, uh, first of all, to, to, to welcome again uh, Dr. Peter, uh, Petra Wilson, um, director of IMSS, and it is a pleasure, and uh, I'll give you the, 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 the floor, let's say. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm very sad that I'm not able to be with you in Portugal. Uh, I had the great pleasure of being in Portugal just last week, um, working uh, with some of your leaders in digital health there, um, but unable to travel again this week. I've been invited to, to speak on this closing plenary um, from the background of HIMSS, um, and I'm going to talk, start by sharing a little bit about what HIMSS is doing, and then to relate that to what is happening in the European health data space. And, and I know we've already spoken around, about the European health data space today, but uh, I will just refresh our memories a little bit about what the objective of this, this big European initiative is. Um, and then uh, I hope have a little further discussion around that. So I am going to share my screen and I hope then that you will see my slides. I hope then you will see my slides, yes. Are you seeing my slides now? Uh, Not yet, but uh, I am. Okay. Mm -mm -mm. You should be seeing my slides. Um, okay, that's not going to work. 
I, I will start sharing, Petra, and you will just say next slide. Okay, give me one second to download your presentation and start sharing, but please just uh, begin with an introduction. Let me, let me see again if I can share that. that. That should be possible. You should be seeing my slide yeah. now. Yeah, works okay. now. Thank you. Okay, very good. Then I just need to see if I can move through my slides, um, which is also not happening right now. Okay. Okay, yeah. Okay, so we're in the right place. Thank you. So the title of, of the stream is, is the future of healthcare uh, data driven? And I just want to go a little bit into that in a moment. But first, let me refresh you about what HIMSS is. So HIMSS is the Health Information Management System Society. And we are a global advisor and thought leader supporting the transformation of health ecosystems through information and technology. Um, so we share uh, the me, Petra, I think uh, we are just looking your uh, presentation, but not in uh, presentation format. I mean, we are blocked on the last slide. You're blocked on the last slide. Okay. Yes, Let yes, Petra. As as I've said, I'll try. Um, I'll begin sharing the presentation on your behalf. Okay. Okay. Then... Unfortunately, that won't take account of changes that I made, but never mind, we'll work with it. Yeah, okay, give me, uh, just continue with what you were saying and give me two seconds to start sharing. Okay, so um, I means I can't really see what you're seeing, but um, I was telling you a little bit about what HIMS is and okay, to if share you could, with if you. you could, yes, you, you already uh, stopped sharing your screen, thank you. Yeah. I've stopped, I believe. Yes, yes, Yeah. go ahead. Okay, um, so let, we're, let's just try and make this as easy as possible. Um, thank you. You are presenting something now. Thank you very much. And if you already move on to the next one, please. So I wanted to share with you something of our vision and mission, which is to realize the full potential of health of every human everywhere. So a very ambitious ambition. And to do that through the reform of global health ecosystems, through the power of, of information and technology. And can we go to the next slide, please? We do this by our work with people like you, the influencers, the governments, the public private sector partnerships, the technology vendors, uh, the policy makers, the finances of healthcare systems, and of course, the healthcare education providers. Through our 100,000 plus individual members and through the stakeholders who we work with, notably stakeholders such as uh, SPMS in Portugal, and we're very grateful for the work that we're able to do with you. If I could have the next slide, please. So I want us to just consider briefly whether the future of healthcare is indeed data driven. Um, and I hope that some of you here will recognize the image of the car, which is on the screen. It's the car from the Back to the Future films. It's the DeLorean. And the reason I've chosen that and the other image is of Hippocrates is that, yes, on the one hand, we are moving forward into a time where healthcare is driven by data. But actually, even Hippocrates already told us that data was the foundation of good healthcare. He didn't call it data. He called it obtaining information from the patient. But remember that Hippocrates urged us. He said, before we lay hands on the patient, we must open our ears and hear what the patient has to say. So we were already being implored then to step back, to listen, to observe, to hear the data, to hear the information, and to then treat the patient. Of course, what's changed since Hippocrates' day is that we now have many physicians and many other sources of data, and we have to find ways of sharing that data. So I would say we are, the future is healthcare driven, is, is data driven, but uh, it is also a case of back to the future because we have been doing this for a long time. What we want to do is learn to do it differently. And with that, I'd like to move ahead to talk a little bit about the European health data space that you've already heard about today. So, Oska, if you could just move ahead to the slide depicting the European health data space, which I believe might be the next one. Yeah, thank you very much. So the European health data space 
is an initiative of the European Union to seek to facilitate that data sharing, to share that data for four broad areas of work. The one that we're all most familiar with, which is, which is sharing data for the purposes of healthcare provision but also recognizing that it's not just about the sort of data that Hippocrates urges to share, but that it's also about understanding the needs of healthcare providers and using data to drive better research, better policy making, and thereby better healthcare systems and services. But the Commission is, of course, also focused on the European aspects, which is about creating a single digital market in health services for making real the possibilities opened by the cross-border care directive. And finally, it's about recognizing that the future of healthcare will be driven by artificial intelligence and artificial intelligence cannot happen without data. And so the European health data is, if you like, our DeLorean vehicle. It's the car within which, through which we will get through to a data-driven future. Uh, could I ask you, Oscar, please, to go to the slide? Uh, I think we may have to go back <laughs> and one more and one more back. Thank you. Sorry, the one that you just had Af after Hippocrates. Thank you very much. This is the, um, I want to share with you Hims's vision of where we are going in terms of advancing the digital future of healthcare and data-driven healthcare. So we have the European health data space, which is a driver for sharing data, but that in itself requires many other channels. And the four big issues that we're focusing on in HIMSS are technical, legal, and operational interoperability, which will in turn drive connected health, but which must be always full um, conscious of and serving data privacy and uh, cyber security for healthcare in order to arrive at the final pillar, which is a value-based healthcare system. And all of these are driven by fundamental values. And those are depicted at the bottom of, of the slide. I'm not going to read through them all in the interest of time, but I do want to draw our attention to what we are, our ultimate objectives are. And our ultimate objectives are to drive health equity, to be prepared for future emergencies and pandemics, to support population and public health, and of course, to use that data-driven healthcare economy to also drive workforce development so that we have a, a healthcare workforce that is able to make best use of the data. And I think with that, I'll leave my opening thoughts and hand over to the next speaker. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, Petra, so much. And uh, we'll continue with uh, Ian McNeil, uh, someone who already uh, knows well this, uh, this uh, uh, medical uh, school, since uh, he has already um uh, talked to, to to us with our master uh, in medical informatics a few years ago and very well known uh, the open er project so thank you Jan. can you please put your mic on this helps to put my mic on apologies thank you yeah, thank you can you see my screen share yes Yes, thank you. Um, and thank you very much for the invitation to join you. I am really sorry I couldn't join. I had hoped to visit Porto. In fact, I booked my flights, but uh, I was a little unwell at, the, at the, the start of the week and decided it wouldn't, it wouldn't be a good idea. COVID negative. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks. Um, anyway, um, so is, the, is health data driven? Health has been data driven for many years. Uh, it's a lot of it's on paper, but it is an information centric environment. Uh, my background is as a family doctor. I'm talking to you today really as a representative of a community known as Open EHR or Open Air, uh, and I'm a director of Open Air International, which is not the not-for-profit which uh, manages the uh, the intellectual property, which is all uh, freely available and open sourced. And it's my job to maybe persuade you that there is a different way of approaching some of the problems that that Petra mentioned, particularly in her uh, slide about the the EU data space. Uh, and I guess. You know, there's lots of discussion about what we mean by interoperability. Uh, and I try to take a step back and say, well, what is it we really want here? Well, what we want is something which 
accepts that this is an immensely complex space in data terms and organizational terms. It doesn't matter which country you're in. We have something which is highly distributed, um, highly granular, lots and lots of different organizations and professionals involved. What we would like is for this to, to function as if it was a single coherent system. We don't have that now. And if we look at you know a typical cancer journey that a patient might take, they will, even you know, in, a, in an increasingly digitized environment, will actually encounter a large number of applications, all of which are trying to tell part of the story, but they're doing it in their own way. Uh, they are siloed. Uh, they're siloed both in terms of their, their uh, user interfaces, but the information models and the data is locked into their own proprietary systems. Curiously, even if they are open source systems, they don't standardize the data in any meaningful way. So how do we get around that problem? Well, one of the ways that people have thought, uh, probably 10 years ago, uh, the phrase semantic interoperability um, came, came to the fore. And this really came, you know, we can use this science of ontology uh, to solve this problem. We can have a lingua franca based around ideas of logics. And, you know, we just have to find some kind of truth in the logic of, of the kind of uh, information we record, and that will solve the problem. Now, indeed, it, it, it solves some of the problem, <clears throat> but people, I think, unfortunately, got carried away, decided that it would solve the whole problem. Uh, and if health records were purely biological records of biological function, then that might be the case, but they're not. And uh, much of the information that are in health, health, health and care records is not biological. It's about what we do and why we do and what we think. It's about opinion. It's contextual and it's cultural and it's arbitrary. It's not particularly truthful in a, in a, in a scientific sense. Um, and we have to negotiate that world as well as make use of the good things that ontologies like SNOMED, CT, et cetera, can do within this information space. So part of the solution and all the whole solution. And the other, um, uh, you know, uh, this is not a, a, an and or, we would use semantic interoperability in the exchange interoperability space. But this is how currently, how most attempts to interoperability are, are, are focused. Um, let's accept that we have everything in its own little siloed space uh, in, in, inside multiple applications with their own ways of thinking about the information. But then let's construct some agnostic models of, you know, a bed or a blood pressure or an allergy and then we uh, we try to read and write the data between these different systems. You can see there's a lot of cost and complexity there. And whilst you know technologies like HL7 Fire have definitely moved this on enormously, a number of us worry that actually we're still going to have a major problem getting this to work coherently. Maybe we just give up and say, look, let's just go back and buy one big system. And you know you see this coming around time and time again. There's a rumor that NHS England are thinking about just reaching out and saying to Epic, look, just sort all this out for us. I think most of us who've been in this space will understand that this is not a great way to go. Monopoly is never a good idea. And uh, no matter how good the company might be now, is this really what we want to do is to hand over a huge amount of infrastructure and IP to you know a very small number of vendors. There's a variation on that appearing and Forbes had a very interesting article, which is to say, the EHR is dead, long live the EHR platform. And that's certainly a, a journey that I've seen in the UK, not just with big hospital systems, but many of the GP systems are gently transforming themselves into platforms by exposing their APIs and their data management functionality to third parties. And that's a good thing, but it still leaves a huge chunk of IP and control inside a very small number of vendors um, okay, they're exposing their APIs, but they've still got that huge amount of control. What we're seeing now is a, is, is a new thing. And this is my world. This is what the Open EHR community has been pioneering for some time, which is to explicitly separate uh, the apps from the data, make the apps user-centric and purpose-centric, make the data patient-centric. Critically, in this world, we strip away uh, the information models and vendor-neutral data stores away from the applications completely. And these, we build sh sh uh, shared and standardized data models built by informaticians and clinicians. Uh, it's a kind of no-code uh, deployment. So we can deploy those shared information models, things like allergies, how do you do meds, how do you do more complex things like end-of-life care, um, apply those to vendor-neutral data stores. And then, of course, we, al we allow the market to come in. So this isn't about uh, you know, one single system, but it's about trying to 
and build those multiple systems around uh, shared data stores that are patient centric, trying to get a coherent model. And then we can build a lot of standard services and reduce the burden on new entrants to the market by doing some of the hard stuff around the platform rather than then asking all of these individual applications to figure out how to do prescribing services in a, in a particular country. It is now happening at scale. So these are all examples just in Europe and there are many more around the world of open healthcare platform based systems. Some are single applications or single vendors, but increasingly we are seeing regional and national systems. Um, John's coming up is going to talk about what they're doing in Wales, uh, but the other major uh, area that has gone down this road is, is Catalonia. Uh, they've got a, uh, a pro um, this is to be their um, uh, regional strategy going forward. So um, if you'd like to know more about this, a good place to start is uh, this very uh, recent event that was held just last week in Berlin. Uh, there's a, a set of uh, very good presentation slides and video recordings that will take you through uh, some of the real examples. It's an exciting time and we think this is probably where the market is going to go over the next 10, 20, 30 years. Thank you. Thank you so much and we continue um, uh, as fast as possible uh, to George Matthews, uh, to Deadless America and, uh, uh, and thank you and welcome. You can start and share your screen. Thank you. I, I actually did not get a screen uh, or a slide in time, so I'll have to do this off the top of my head. I hope that's okay. I'll try not to use too many hand gestures and whatnot. Even but, better, even better. <laughs> thank you so much for letting me join. Um, as I've been listening to uh, my, my fellow panel members, um, I'm struck by the similarity in some of the observations we're making. Um, you know, the U.S., as you know, like anything, is we always have our own take on it. It's not always um, right, uh, but it is unfortunately what we have to deal with. So um, as as you'd said, I, I am the chief medical officer for Daedalus in North America. That's part of our Daedalus Global Organization, which is probably more familiar with some of our European uh, uh, colleagues, uh, since we do play more of a role in uh, NHS or in some of the EMRs in Spain and whatnot, obviously Middle East, uh, uh, Australia, New Zealand, uh, and in Africa. Uh, but we're kind of near in North America. Uh, so what we deal with here, just to set the stage, as you know, we have probably one of the largest for-profit healthcare systems, if not the, in the world, uh, which is really made up of smaller for-profit entities that uh, work at multiple levels. Uh, we separate them typically in payer provider and life sciences, as well as the federal government and state government takes care of some things as well. Um, here, what we focus on mostly is interoperability. Um, we are behind a lot of uh, our colleagues across the Atlantic uh, in terms of trying to get folks to open up their silos and share their data. And while the, our platform here is able to, you know, it's built to allow for the transfer of data using smart on fire standards, uh, transferring HL7 claims data, ADT data, and a, the whole slew of alphabet in terms of transferring data. What we see more often is the difficulty of changing existing business models to allow for this type of interoperability to happen. Most of, as you know, uh, the healthcare here is for profit. And now that data has been, <clears throat> excuse me, health data in particular has been recognized as a, not only a financial asset, but also a competitive advantage there's even more incentive to keep those silos up. So there are laws that have been put passed through to try to promote interoperability, which we are trying to work with their timeline, but it is taking a lot more time than we would like to be able to get that interoperability, those interoperability laws in place. So as we're seeing the market evolve here, um, what we're starting to see are trends uh, that are evolving. And again, like anyone else, we can try to forecast where this might go. Hopefully we'll learn some of the lessons from looking at you all and seeing how you all are doing things. And hopefully we can adopt some of the best practices. But as I said, with a for-profit uh, mentality leading the charge, it's very difficult to mount a public health response as we've seen with the recent COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so when we look at it, the trends that we're seeing here, um, you know, I think, uh, one of my colleagues have mentioned this before, 
you know, data-driven healthcare. And the way we are seeing it, data is good, but more data isn't necessarily better. Um, what we've started to see is the shift towards, well, first we need as much claims information as possible to analyze it and put it through the algorithm and try to forecast what's going to happen. The limitation of it being that it's based on payment models, right? Uh, you know, I will see, get the service, have a claim filed, and within 90 to 120 days, I should get some type of response financially or an error on the claim I filed. We started uh, improving that data with some of the HL7 EMR data that we would get as well to see if that would actually help with giving us a more robust picture of patients. Um, and that's turned to be out to be less than complete as well, not surprisingly. So now it seems that uh, the, the view is turned towards getting what we're calling social determinants of health or more uh, accelerometer data off of phones or trying to get people to engage with apps. So we're looking at a variety of data to create a more complete picture of the patient. But I don't know if that's necessarily helping the patient. Um, many of the companies and apps that are coming up are promoting their aspect of healthcare, whether it's mental health or diabetes care or whatnot. And it's not being integrated into a whole system that can help the patient. So while we are trying to help our clients figure out how to harmonize their data, how to, how to uh, tag their data so it can be queried for later use, we're really trying to get them to think about what is your use case? What are you really trying to accomplish? Is it just a single isolated diabetes program or are you trying to improve the whole health of the patient? Um, and those are hard questions because as the businesses are here, especially in healthcare delivery, many, many uh, systems are compartmentalized. So there isn't as much financial incentive to work across multiple sectors or multiple departments. So we are trying to encourage them to think about this in a more global sense. Um, the second thing that we're seeing is um, technology is good, but what we really require, as I said before, is business model innovation. Most of the care in the United States is delivered at a fee-for-service model. Uh, the more times you turn the turnstile, the more we get paid. And to shift it towards value-based care has been a challenge, if only because as the best we've been able to do is dedicate resources to potentially both models. Ultimately, the providers have had to take some type of capitated risk to determine if they can actually manage the financial uh, aspect of not having patients come through and fill a head in a bed, as we would term it. Um, but it hasn't been enough. And we're still on the concept of how do we make more money? And I think in some ways that's a more of an indictment of how our healthcare system works here in the States. When we look at the metrics and how success is measured for any organization, healthcare or otherwise, it's mostly based on quarterly and annual profitability. It's not based on, did you improve the healthcare level of your constituents or your panel of patients? And though that seems strange, um, I, I bring it up because it's becoming more and more apparent as more data becomes more available. People are looking at the health of their communities and looking at their nonprofit status hospital in their area and realizing that while they put on a billion dollar wing, people in that local area are not getting the care they need. So I do think that there's giving a rise to almost a do-it-yourself model where people may actually reject technology and try to come up with a level of care they can afford. Because at least in the States, healthcare is becoming a luxury item. Um, unless you have the deep pockets or insurance, you can't get it. Um, and to note that uh, this is becoming more important as patients become more aware of how to take care of themselves. I have a colleague who's actually at uh, the Barcelona Health Hub conference today, who is presenting as a patient, talking about how patients need to be brought into the co-design of healthcare. That's something I don't think we would have even heard of five years ago, but patients are demanding a voice at the table because the care affects them. Um, you know, that is kind of the next trend where because it gets more cost prohibitive, patients are looking for ways to hack the system, get the care they need when they can't afford it. Technology is becoming cheaper. Um, and if they don't get the type of care that they would get from a normal healthcare system, 
they will try to, uh, to get it any way they can. We see a combination of this and decentralized technologies as a way of patients to circumvent the system and collect their own data. And then as a collective pool, start negotiating with current healthcare incumbents to try to get the care that they need or want. Um, we're probably more than a few years away from that, but we are seeing uh, green shoots happen even in the United States. I think other countries are ahead of us. Um, and we are starting to look at uh, models of innovation in Africa, in India, in China, uh, the old uh, CK Prahlad bottom of the pyramid innovation, where when you have a scarcity of resources, how do you innovate? And then how do you share those innovations? Um, we have areas of the United States that are very similar to that. So we're using, we're starting to see those models pop up. And last but not least, and Petra, I believe you actually have this in the model for HIMSS in Europe, privacy. Uh, and unfortunately, here in the US, it'll be privacy at a premium. Um, we don't have a GDPR, as you know, and the attempts we have in California, Virginia, Arizona, I believe, and others are all being held back, not just because of healthcare reasons, but because of other larger multi-billion dollar companies that are dependent on uh, data privacy not being a uh, protected right. Um, unfortunately, healthcare does fall under that category uh, because many companies are circumventing a lot of the typical consent laws for patients that come into a hospital, similar to uh, filling out an end user license agreement and obtaining that data from patients without really telling them how it can be used. Um, it's becoming more and more apparent post Cambridge Analytica that that data is being used without proper consent. But whether we get to a privacy law here will be, it remains to be seen. However, companies such as Apple are now offering some type of privacy at a premium if, you can, if you're willing to pay the price the right to be forgotten. How that develops in healthcare remains to be seen, but I do think more and more people as they're trying to find that level of trust in the equivalent of a healthcare professional to not share their data without their permission or not use in a way that can be monetized, that will become more desirable and may allow for a stratification of different healthcare services. These are the, the trends that we see, obviously we could be wrong, but we're trying to make sure our interoperability platform can support it. I apologize for going so long, but I hope that was helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, George. It's, uh, it's really important to have, uh, to have uh, different uh, views from around the world and uh, very uh, different uh, healthcare systems. Also in Europe, uh, and now we'll go to, to, to Italy uh, with uh, Sergio Pilon, uh, which uh, will, will have a, a more mixed uh, uh, system, uh, such as we are actually in Portugal. Uh, uh, so uh, welcome and, and, and please uh, start. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm sharing my screen. Uh, well, I'm not talking about problems, so we have many, but uh, I will try to show what are the solutions. Uh, the solutions we are planning in Italy, this is uh, our idea of a telemedicine matrix. You have a health and care action, then you have specialties. I'm a doctor, so this is a doctor point of view. Then we have place, place where health and care are provided. With this matrix, you have to have people. What this means, digitally remaster health and care. Just say the action, telehealth, telemonitoring, tele rehab, tele everywhere. But specialties, I mean, cardiology, just early intervention, lifestyle, uh, uh, any kind of different action for every specialty. Then you have emergency room, home offices, nursing home. Then we have special environment we will introduce with the next, uh, uh, next generation EU plan. Casa della Comunità, Ospedale della Comunità. This is really complex scenario. Then you have people with social culture, family, omics, place, income. Place means uh, close to the hospital, uh, far from the hospital, and every, everything. With this matrix, we are trying to uh, also put the environment in the healthcare. This is just a work we have done uh, 
uh, this is the amount of CO2 saved in uh, 7027 televisit. We are working not only for money, uh, around money, not only around movement, but the environment. This is the model that we are planning with the next generation EU. We have acute hospital, we have nurse hospital, only four hours uh, a day for doctors. Then we have a community house hub, 24 hours uh, open. Uh, community houses spoke, then we have home and everything is managed in uh, Centrale Operativa Territoriale. So big movement of data. This is a draft, both in Italian stands for draft, of the government plan for the next generation EU. We will have six level of services, let's say services. First level is healthy person without any condition, without uh, needs. We have to not like the old version, uh, you are healthy, don't bother me as doctor. You are healthy, we have to work to keep you healthy. Then we have second, uh, minimal. Then we have third, four, fifth, six is dying, means uh, uh, end of life. We have, uh, let, let's look here, uh, simple action, coordinated simple action here, then complex, complex and complex. We have three level of complex and one simplex. What, what, where is e health? e health is here. This is simplex. In simplex, we start, even in simplex, with digital literacy of the patient. Even complex, obviously, we have to evaluate the capability of self-care and digital knowledge. So we endorse the digital knowledge. Uh, yes, we as doctors and nurses are used to teach the patient and we are uh, supposed to teach also some digital knowledge of the patient to use digital health services. Then we have the plan of e-health activities for simple and for complex. Uh, this is the uh, very, very uh, quick draft of the next generation EU plan for Italy for health. This is just an example of what happened in the United States. Uh, those are numbers, so millions. Uh, you, you can see the shift from the uh, ambulatory visit in telehealth visit and the number uh, you know in it in uh, even in the United States so you have north south west and east uh, same in Italy and this is mainly based on culture people culture uh, in uh, recent Indiana University uh, paper they analyzed the uh, telehealth uh, results compared to culture of the people. Less is the culture, more strong, uh, more stronger is the resistance to digital health. And this is the green. In Northwest of United States, this is the green part. This is CO2 reduction. Uh, for telehealth. So telehealth is green. Uh, you know, we pay a lot of money to treat the patient for the disease caused by the pollution we produce to cure them. And this is paradox. We produce pollution to cure the patient. Thanks. This is quick. Uh, Italian point of view. Those are my contact. Thank you. Thank you, Sergio.
Thank you. The, uh, a lot, this, uh, all these presentations would uh, uh, be very interesting to, to discuss, uh, but we are uh, at the end of the day, and uh, it's uh, at least good uh, to see the different opinions and, and uh, the different uh, um, um, directions that each health care system is uh, trying to give within the, the digital transformation uh, of health. And now we continue with uh, John Meredith uh, from, from Wales uh, NHS. Um, uh, thank you, and please uh, go ahead. Put your mic on, please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry, I started to have a little mild panic attack that my mouse wasn't responding to my, uh, my clicks. Um, it happens to us all, doesn't it? Um, I'm uh, well. First of all, thank you very much um, for, um, uh, for for letting me speak. Um, can you just keep up? can you see my PowerPoint deck there? Not yet. No. Not yet. There you go. I've, I've messed up with that too. Hang on a second. You should see it now. Is that right? Uska, if you can. Yeah, we are we are seeing maybe your other screen. Okay, yes, we are seeing. Okay, now. Yeah, okay. Fantastic. So, yes, thank you. Thank you for inviting me. Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to actually be with you virtually, if not, if not uh, in person. So I'm, I'm going to take you through a, sort of a, a brief journey about, um, about uh, the company, uh, the organization for Digital Health and Care Wales, um, and uh, the journey towards an open platform approach. Um, Essentially, you know, I represent uh, an organisation uh, that is, uh, is predicated on building um, applications and solutions for um, for health and care in Wales. We're also supporting uh, a national program called the National Data Resource in uh, delivering, you know, next generation analytical services. Um, and um, uh, you can see, basically, the word digital keeps on appearing quite a lot. It is is front and centre to to everything we do. Um, I started my time with the, uh, the National Digital Team Architect in the National Solution for Diabetes Management. And uh, in, in many of these cases, you know, we sit down with clinicians, we start looking at the data requirements, uh, the clinical workflow, etc. Um, and, and start to think about what sorts of questions uh, clinicians ask the patient, how we start to categorize them. Um, you know, this is a point of about four, four or so years ago, and uh, little did I know at the time that these granular data items had names in the form of uh, archetypes and, and templates, and also a process uh, that took the form of uh, what, what Ian was describing earlier on, open air. Um, and, you know, there's no time to actually go into, into the detail about what that actually means. Uh, but at a very high level, you know, I, I sort of started to discover there was an approach that maybe would be beneficial for us. And at the same time as well, we had colleagues that started exploring, you know, the emerging interoperability standard HL7 fire um, and, and wondered if that was uh, potentially going to be a solution. Uh, could we use one or the other or could we use both? Um, uh, to essentially support the uh, DHCW uh, aim of becoming more data driven. In 2019, we had a report published uh, for a uh, digital architecture review. And um, whilst I won't go into you know, the, all of the detail, you can look up that support, uh, that report, it is available uh, online. Um, you know, a couple of the key um, sort of um, elements associated with that are about us, uh, you know, establishing a set of architectural design principles um, and, and obviously focusing on the work uh, of the National Data Resource to develop this national clinical data repository. Um, and at that time, also, I was conducting a review into, uh, into open air as a, as a viable technology for us to uh, adopt. Um, and during that, the course of that, it, it pointed to how it can be used in an increasingly blended architecture that it supports the use cases um, that, that we are seeking, but also is complementary to technologies such as SNOMED CT and HL7 Fire. Um, 
Fundamentally, though, we needed standardized published open APIs, and they could be native APIs that, that are currently used. Um, they could be, you know, open air fire, or they could be a variety of different different things. We can't rule out, you know, um, using what's currently there, um, you know, the current services that, that exist, whilst we still have gaps that we need to provision for, um, those, those current APIs might persist for a significant period of time. And not everything needs to be replaced. You know, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. Etc. Um, importantly, though, we started to understand that a persistent data model could potentially outlive the application. Um, and, you know, the open platform being a, a technology neutral um, uh, thing, um, because we're talking about the standards that are for use and not necessarily the implementation of them. So the open platform approach is something that transcends vendor implementations and represents a common guide rail for us to follow. And the, also the open platform is predicated upon data that is stored and managed in a secure and auditable way at scale. And uh, this ultimately, uh, we think, creates an economy of scale due to its reusability in releasing design and development resource over time. So in becoming data driven, we appreciate that we have to shift our mentality somewhat. Separating persistence from the application first allows data to outlive the application. It's very important for us working in a heterogeneous digital ecosystem. It's also important to maintain vendor neutrality. It's a heritage we have uh, in Wales for our digital services that we're incredibly proud of. But in doing so, we will provide other benefits such as reduced maintenance overheads, et cetera, et cetera. So after all, the application models that should focus on supporting the application function itself, i.e., you know, the code that goes into apps and other digital tooling, you know, needs to needs to support that principal use case of providing good user experience for clinicians and, and, and patients alike. You know, that's the reason why the app needs to be built. The underlying persistence models that they can then be developed and maintained independently, that's a really important separation of concerns that needs to be considered. And it's now starting to become front and center at everything we do. But this then in turn facilitates programming language independence. And uh, again, that reusable component approach uh, of low code. So um, getting to these goals is an understanding of the facets of interoperability, and this has been alluded to uh, by, both by, by Ian uh, and, and Petra, um, and specifically about how technology can support, um, you, know, um, you know, these individual facets. Importantly, though, there is no one perfect fit. Our choice of platform technology is predicated upon the use case at hand and whatever clinical problem we are trying to solve at a given time period. But these overall four pillars of interoperability may not always be applicable to use cases. But from a national perspective, we're kind of looking at the, the, you know, the nexus of these concentric circles sitting right in the middle there. Importantly, combining technologies gives us this best of breed capability. The differences between fire and open air, for example, uh, mean that when you use them together, they become more than the sum of their parts. Um, you know, and I won't read all of those into detail, but essentially what we're saying is that, you know, we can, we can merge these things together and they will be complemented. So how does this look at a high level? Well, you know, essentially adopting open air for, for us in NHS Wales would allow us to start that transition from the siloed and document bound to the open platform we start to build with a future first mentality, but that doesn't necessarily imply there's a lack of complexity. This is inherently hard. Data is stored separately from the applications that collect and edit and display it. The data layer then helps to deliver data that is standardized in terms of format, nomenclature, terminology, definition, et cetera, which then allows it to flow into other systems as specified and governed by the data owner. Good rules for data storage will not change much, if at all. Um, but by allowing for this increasingly granular, more complex persistence over time, we can ultimately then increase uh, or provide an increasing interoperability capability over time. And you know, at the top layer there, the application layer requires you know a full you know systemic design for workflow which means that it has to know the context and what became for in the patient journey and what comes after in the care journey. Um, but of course, with a, a maximal approach to that, that structured data repository um, at the, as its foundation, we get a lot more flexibility um, as a result. 
this is quite a new slide and, and, and it is, is a very high level um, uh, logical description of what our merging open architecture platform uh, is. It's, it's a painting, painting a target of the open platform for us. The key to this is the requirement that the you know, data is the currency by which our partners across NHS Wales can transact. So uh, our, our local health boards, and let me turn on my, uh, my little laser pointer, virtual laser pointer here. So our, uh, our health board uh, partners, for example, can find normalized data for analytics as part of our national data lake house uh, initiative. In turn also can, can harvest structured data via Welsh care data repository, the WCDR. Um, but of course, over here, you know, we've got a boundary around what our day-to-day -day, uh, uh, work is, or certainly my day-to-day -day work as part of uh, Digital Health and Care Wales, and this emerging element called the Clinical Data Engine, which essentially is, is open air plus a, plus a low-code e-forms capability uh, so that we can support the emerging use cases, but importantly, reuse the common data structures and, and data uh, uh, itself for a variety of different um, emerging use cases be they whatever the next diabetes solution is or cancer, cardiology, et cetera, et cetera. So I'll leave you with, you know, just the, just the notion that maybe we should, we should be data driven and also free that data um, because the information model should no longer be the domain of the third party vendors. You know, as I mentioned, we've got a vendor neutrality kind of concept at the core of what we do. Um, and our core mission now is to facilitate access to data across those organizational and regional boundaries, representing that clinical data in a ubiquitous way for a variety of different consumers. But importantly as well, this replicates the principles that founded the NHS in the first place. Uh, we can just substitute that to mean that data at the access, uh, data access at that point of need. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, um, John. And uh, we finished the, the, the talks um, by Zoom. But uh, uh, again, I will welcome uh, Ponciano Oliveira uh, to, to talk a little bit about the experience here in the northern region of Portugal. Thank you. Thank you very much. I, first of all, I would like to thank you for the invitation to be here. Uh, to Mr. Nunes da Abreu, my uh, colleague and dear friend. Uh, the, the, the feeling is mutual and I thank you for your words. Professor João Fonseca, it's always a pleasure to be here in uh, this uh, uh, magnificent institution and I will take the chance to, uh, to, 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 to greet also Professor Altamir uh, da Costa Pereira and uh, Professor uh, Cruz Correa, also present here. I would like also to, 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 to greet my colleagues in the table and I will just have a, a short brief on this matter. Uh, when we talk about uh, the provision of healthcare and, will, uh, and answering the question, uh, will the next generation of healthcare systems be, uh, will be data driven? Well, I think it demands for a, a, a mandatory answer and the answer is inevitably they will be for sure uh, either voluntary either uh, pushed by, uh, the, by 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 the, the fact because the truth is uh, in our days we, uh, we we have a huge challenge on healthcare provision um, the demand of the, the, the increase of costs uh, with technology with uh, chronic diseases with uh, with the, the people's expectations, with the, 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 the technology available, uh, which we'll have to, 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 to provide at the sustainable costs, will take us to that point. And uh, it's consensual in the literature that uh, in these days, uh, incremental reforms did not solve the problems. We had introduced uh, several measures, uh, such as uh, the, the, the administrative reductions of, of costs, uh, the quality in health, the electronic health record, and the, it all helped to improve the quality of care, uh, the security of care, and the, the sustainability of care, but it didn't solve the problems. At this point, we need a, a new model of provision of care, and that new model is based on uh, uh, increasing the productivity and uh, the, the increasing the, the value of, of care 
uh, which is driven uh, by our uh, our uh, our healthcare systems how can we do that we have been trying the task shifting we have been trying uh, the the patient report and uh, uh, patient report and uh, outputs uh, patient report and outputs and the truth is uh, we need those coordinated systems uh, assist assistance systems and processes to uh, get to a level uh, another level of of uh, productivity and uh, and uh, and value of care driven uh, having that say said how can uh, uh, that uh, help uh, or how that demands for uh, uh, another vision of uh, of of date for the data in healthcare in it all starts here we usually talk about in these forums about information or information systems or technology and uh, only on forums like this we are talking about data which is the true uh, value that we need uh, for those uh, technologies we need the the the, the information the, the storage capacity we need the process capacity we need the the, the integration uh, capacity uh, in order to, to transform that data into knowledge that can support our new ways of uh, uh, providing care, such as value-based health care or uh, artificial intelligence, uh, or even uh, in, in is to, 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 to provide it with, with uh, new levels of social cohesion. Uh, we can always think about the, the menaces that these uh, these new ways and expensive ways of driving care such as in, uh, artificial intelligence can the gaps that they can create between the the rich and the richer and poor people but we uh, must also uh, think about the solution that for example telemonitorization or 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 um, uh, or, 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 or telescreening can give us we solved some years ago we have sold uh, we have uh, solved a waiting list in northeast part of the region uh, of in, in what concerns to dermatology we solved that waiting list recurring to uh, the, the the telemonitorization of uh, of of the, the the patients we had there with increase of quality of care uh, because of course we have much better uh, uh, facilities here in Porto and in that region it's not even sustainable to have such a different such a sophisticated equipment and resources in that part of region with a low density territory so returning to our question I think that it will be mandatory it will the systems will be pushed the tweet some slower some some faster but it will be our reality uh, in in this in, in a few years because the reality does demand it uh, i just uh, must have uh, 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 some 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 caution we just we we, we do have to have some cost uh, some cautions because and they were pointed by the colleagues they won't they only will only be healthcare driven data driven uh, systems if they are uh, data store driven uh, data processing driven data secure driven and uh, data integrated uh, driven and data reliable driven only that way we can transform it into the knowledge that we need uh, for the, the, those new uh, models of provision of care Thank you so much, Dr. Panciano, and uh, I'll, I'll ask you now to, to award uh, our uh, global shapers that are, that are present, please. Thank you so much, panel. This was amazing, and uh, it was a fantastic contribution. We couldn't end the day. Uh, I have to apologize for the delay we have, but now we are more or less on time. Calling here that are in present, uh, the Dr. McFeely and uh, uh, Caterina Gomes and Valerie uh, Larsi to come here, please, and be having the, um, uh, the certificates from the hands of 
the session co-chairs that there. So maybe, maybe, uh, Doctor Professor Fonseca, Doctor, you can stay here. Wait, you're in the line, and I go. You come here, and I, we do the delivery for the the our artists here are going to take the pictures and George making it. Okay. And a round of applause uh, for the Global Shapers. A round of applause. And Valerie. Yes. Well done, well done. A, a, a picture all together, if you don't mind. Uh, also, I'm putting in myself also. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think that we can call the session over. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, everyone watching in Facebook. Thank you so much, our guest speakers on Zoom. Uh, so sorry that you cannot join us now for the guest speaker dinners here, but maybe on other occasions. I know that uh, all of you tried hard to come here and be in person. Uh, COVID is not handed the way, and, uh, but ne maybe next year we can do this uh, gathering uh, happening. Thank you so much, Reji. Let's call it the day off. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everybody that support this event. And uh, we faced uh, so many stressful moments, but we overcome them. And now we're going to have uh, some rest for till tomorrow. We start here at 9 o'clock local time, so please be a little bit uh, earlier than 9 and 10 uh, CET. And uh, of course, the rest of the time zones are in the agenda. Thank you so much and see you tomorrow.